All right, what do you think? Should we get started? I think so. Five minutes past the hour. Right. I think it's time to, to get going. So um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we really kick things off here. Um, just kind of how we had the, the comments, the, the questions there. Feel free at any point during the conversation to ask any questions and put them in the questions box. We'll answer all your questions toward the end. So um, please add as many things, uh, anything that you want as possible, anything that comes up or anything you want clarified, we're happy to answer that. Uh, I'm just seeing also, welcome Joanne, also Linwood, New, also New Jersey from donors around the USA. Very cool. Um, we will send this recording to everybody who registered. So if for any reason you need to hop off or anything happens throughout, we will send uh, over this recording as well as any other links and reference materials, which we'll have some towards the end that Sarah will be sharing, and, uh, as well as a, uh, a brief survey. As soon as uh, the webinar ends, you'll get a survey. It's literally five seconds. It's one question. It really helps us if you could uh, just take that time to answer it because you know we want to make sure that we're offering the best content for, for you all. And if you could just take that time, that really, really helps us out. So really appreciate your time if you could get to that. So housekeeping aside, um, we can get into a couple introductions. So uh, first of all, my name is Sebastian Arseniega. I'm a partner manager here at IATS Payments by Deluxe. IATS is a payment processor dedicated solely to serving nonprofit organizations of all sizes. Uh, in my role at IATS, I have the fortune of speaking with and learning from nonprofit industry experts in fundraising, technology, and strategy. And it's, uh, it's my privilege to be able to share these voices with our audience to continue growing our community. So today I am joined by my good friend and fundraising expert, Sarah Hushley. Sarah, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. Me too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. So to get started, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your sort of story getting into fundraising, into the position you are, at, are right now, and uh, tell us a little bit about Charity Shift and, and Connect for Good as well. Sure, yeah. Well, like a lot of, uh, you know, kind of background stories and origin stories, mine is, is quite long. The condensed version is I sort of fell into fundraising, as a lot of people do. I know we've got development managers, executive directors, um, different people on the call, and, and maybe this story resonates with you. Um, I was working in Belize, which is in Central America, and I was doing volunteer recruitment. That was in 2009, so over 15 years ago. Um, and we, the organization basically found itself in a situation that uh, uh, they had run out of a lot of revenue and, and needed to, to bring money in quick. I'd never really done any fundraising, and so kind of did my first peer-to-peer -peer campaign, which back then was pretty new um, and it was really successful and I really loved it. And so in 2009, came back to Canada and decided, I think I wanna do this for my career. And so I've been doing that pretty much ever since. So um, uh, in nonprofit, so I was an executive director um, for a small nonprofit. Um, I've worked in larger organizations, working in fundraising. So kind of had an opportunity to learn in lots of different um, nonprofits. And for the last four and a half years, I've been doing fundraising consulting. So specifically doing fundraising plans for um, small fundraising teams, whether that is at a small nonprofit or a larger organization. Um, so that's uh, my company, Charity Shift, which does the fundraising plans. And then I've also started um, an online community just for Canadian nonprofits called Connect for Good that connects uh, nonprofits in Canada with resources that serve them. So that's kind of what led me to um, to where I am today. But today specifically, we'll be talking about um, fundraising plans and really how to maximize your fundraising um, within small fundraising teams. Exactly right. Yeah, as the title suggested, big results with small teams. So we really want to help everyone out with specifically that. And we asked everyone a survey question in the, in the registration um, about sort of what you're hoping to learn from today's session. And we did see that the overwhelming majority of people answered um, how to know where to focus your efforts and get the, the best results, uh, followed by how to create more consistency and sustainability in fundraising. And I think those two really do cover quite a bit about what we want to talk about. Yeah. And I really want to make sure that we're answering those questions. So um, we're really going to try to focus around how to you know, make sure people can, can focus their efforts to get those results that they're trying to do. And once you have that focus, how to scale and build that sustainability and um, rep repeatability in the process. Mm -hmm. um, I think to get started here as well and kind of start digging into the meat of the conversation a bit more, 
Sarah, why is fundraising so hard? Why, why do we need to have this conversation <laughs> in the first place? You know, it is such a such a good question. I think we could take this in a lot of directions, but I think if we really peel back and and dive right into the heart of it, I think fundraising is hard because when we're super passionate about a cause that we really care about, it is so hard to kind of be vulnerable and say to other people, you know, this is something I really, really care about. Will you join me in caring about it too? And specifically caring about it by giving a donation. And so I think fundraising is challenging, number one, because it makes us be vulnerable and, and maybe have conversations that are a bit challenging. Um, and I think another thing is that sometimes we view fundraising as like holding our hand out for, you know, a donation as opposed to really inviting somebody to join you in the work that you're doing. Um, so it can feel like we're sort of asking a favor or we're, you know, hoping that somebody else will do something that's, um, you know, something that they're trying to trick them into doing something they don't want to do, for example. So it can feel really kind of, you know, a lot of people get into the nonprofit sector because they don't want to work in business. They don't want to necessarily focus on bringing in revenue and that sort of thing. And so it does, I think, bring up a lot of uncomfortable feelings around money. Um, and I think the other thing, like, let's be realistic, the, the cost of everything has gone up. Um, and, you know, some people say we're in a recession, we're coming up to a recession where, you know, it, it's difficult right now, I think, in a lot of places. So our, our expenses are up, our revenues in some areas are down. I think during COVID, and post COVID, there was a lot of additional uh, government funding, a lot of um, individuals who might have had some surplus revenue that were um, donating more to charities than they normally did. And a lot of that has, you know, especially the government funding, that's dried up now um, for the most part. A lot of individuals, um, you know, might have might have lost their jobs, might have not have the same amount of of income to donate to charity. So we're seeing. In this moment in time, I think this really interesting um, time where our expenses in nonprofits have gone up significantly and our revenues have not sustainably matched. Um, and so I think that's why a lot of organizations at this point in time are thinking, you know, what we've done up until this point has gotten us here, but it might not get us a year, three years, five years, 10 years from now. What can we do now to really build out that sustainability uh, and make sure that we do continue to grow and be successful well into the future? Yeah, and I think that's a really great point, you know, just in general talking about just the changing environment that you're working in as a fundraiser, as any organization really. Um, what works today won't work tomorrow necessarily. It's not guaranteed to work tomorrow. And works to, works, what works tomorrow is not guaranteed to work for the next day. So. How do you keep in mind that sort of flexibility and adaptability to all these changes? Because of course, this isn't the first time we've had recessions or anything like that. So how have you, you know, what are some of the ways that you see organizations adapt to these sorts of things and respond to these pressures so that they can continue to succeed in these in these more difficult times compared to what was what came before? Mm -hmm. Oh, such a good question. I think one thing about fundraising that sometimes we forget is that it is a consistent process. It is mm. something that, you know, unlike when we might be looking at um, grant funding, um, you know, we might spend a couple months writing a really big grant and we get the funding. Um, that that certainly, you know, definitely happens. But but for the most part, fundraising is really about day to day consistent actions. And let's be honest, most organizations are maxed out in terms yeah. of. Um, you know, capacity and and uh, and that sort of thing. So I think sometimes those day to day things that really build consistency, build momentum, build those sustainable practices sometimes fall by the wayside because they aren't those urgent things that are really keeping our attention. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, and I'm sure those of you on the call who have done fundraising for a while, there's something really interesting about our profession, and that is that everybody thinks they can do it, right? Everybody thinks that they, you just got to talk to Bill Gates, or you just got to get another grant, or you just, you just got to throw a gala. And I think the thing is, is that we don't want to discourage people's enthusiasm and, you know, well-meaning board members and, and well-meaning people who tell us what we should do. But on the other hand, we are the experts within our own organization. And 
a little bit closer to the reality that like, sure, Bill Gates gives away a lot of money. Chances are he already knows he's giving the money to. It's not just some like magic fix all, right? And so I think that also kind of makes fundraising difficult because it can feel like everyone around the organization is giving you all of these different ideas and all of these different strategies. And sometimes you will do them. You might take on, you know, a local uh, fundraising event. You might take on a new idea that maybe in your heart, you know, you probably shouldn't, but because somebody brought it to you and you feel like, oh, well, you know, it's a board member or it's, it's somebody that we should, um, you know, try and partner with. And so you do get stretched in so many different directions that it makes sense that our small teams are struggling because we're trying to do way too many things at once. Um, and so one of the things that I do when I'm working with small teams is um, we do this activity that we take a look at, like, where is the money coming from? If we look at all of the fundraising efforts that we have, where's the majority of the fundraising uh, revenue coming from? And then on the other hand, where is the majority of our work, our time, our volunteer time, our staff time, even our money? Like, where is that investment happening? And do those two things align? Um, and it's a really quick eye-opening way to say, wait a second, we're spending all this money on, you know, a fundraising event that's only bringing in a small amount of money. What can we do to um, use less resources, less staff time, less, less money, and really maximize um, the revenue that, that's coming in? I mean, all of those were just really excellent points overall. And, you know, that exercise sounds really valuable to to see where people are focusing their time. I mean, I'm a believer in sort of the Pareto principle that 20% of your efforts usually produce 80% of your results overall. And being able to take a hard look and analyze uh, what you're doing is really gonna help you understand what works um, for your organization. Um, but I wanna touch that, I wanna kind of mesh that in with sort of the, the number two answered uh, question, which was about consistency and sustainability as well, because we've also you know, talked about how these things change over time. So when you're doing an exercise like that, how do you bring in elements of consistency and sustainability? Like, cause that might work for, you know, a short term. What do we, what are some of the things that we can offer that are going to help people have that sort of long-term um, value out of that sort of conversation as well? Because, you know, people change in organizations, things change rapidly all the time. The world changes uh, rapidly. So how, how are, what are some, some ways that people can think about that and what, why are the people maybe stray away from, core fundraising goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to consistency, I, I don't think it's lack of effort or lack of intention. Mm -hmm. I, I genuinely think it's people don't have the capacity. Um, one of the charities that I work with, a strategy that they've taken on board that has really, really paid back a lot in terms of their success is they've committed to sending out a weekly email to their um, their audience. So their audience includes both donors, people on their email list. Um, they also do a blog and they also do posts on Facebook. So they've committed that every Wednesday, everybody who cares about our charity is going to hear from us one way or another. Mm -hmm. And it usually is one story. Um, if we're doing any sort of fundraising, it is one call to action. Um, and so I think that's really so in terms of consistency, it's every week. It is just a thing that we do every week. And yes, it takes time, but it does mean that I think our donors and our supporters, when it comes to thinking about what charity they want to support, we've been in touch with them in the last seven days, right? Mm -hmm. Whether whether they're opening all of our emails or not, they at least know that we're getting in front of them. Um, and I will say for some of you listening to this, you might think, oh my gosh, every week, that's impossible. And I get it. Um, if you can do once a month, that's great. If you can do every two weeks, that's great. And one of the ways that you can really easily do that is, and, and I did this when I was an executive director as well, that we would do our, you know, monthly newsletter and everybody would contribute to it of all these different things that were happening. And once a month, we'd send out a monthly newsletter that would have like 14 different stories. Mm -hmm. And we'd be asking people to like bring in their recycling so that we could, you know, cash those in and sign up for this event that we had and make a donation. And 
here's an introduction to our new receptionist. Like it was literally everything and hardly anybody opened them and they certainly didn't donate. And I think that we have this idea from historically when a newsletter used to be a printed document, right? That we would mail out to our supporters to say, look at all the amazing stuff that we've done. But we know that email doesn't work that way. And we also know that people's attention spans these days, like they're not very long. And so what I would recommend is if you're already doing those newsletters, break out each of those stories and have them in one contained item. So if you're going to talk about location um, of your program that just opened, that is one email. That is one story. It just has that. And that's it. And once you're taking all of that content that used to go into, you know, a 14 piece monthly newsletter and you start breaking out all of those pieces, it, it does become fairly easy um, to kind of have that, that content so that you do have um, information to share more regularly. That is so, I, I just went through kind of a little bit of an arc there, kind of a dramatic okay. arc, because when you said weekly newsletter, like I sent out a monthly newsletter to the partners yeah. that I work with and I was thinking yeah. weekly, like <laughs> who yeah. has time to do that? But then, <laughs> you know, following what you just said and just following that story, I mean, if I just broke up what I had in the monthly one into, you know, different things, like mm -hmm. I went from being very anxious to being like, oh, actually, yeah, that's doable. So, you know, yeah, um, yeah no, that's, that's a, that's a great advice overall. That's really, I mean, worthwhile. And, and I think, you know, that kind of speaks to the, the value of, um, you know, tying this back to the idea of, you know, finding the Bill Gates or the, everything like this and finding the one-off solution really where it kind of comes down to and what anybody in fundraising is, is I'm sure not along to is that it's about showing up and it's about being consistent and it's not always going to work the way you want it to, but it's about just week after week, just keep trying, keep doing new things that you think are going to be sustainable for your team and doable for your team that you're going to be able to maintain. But it's that idea of just, just being there for your constituents mm -hmm. and just showing up and just showing that you have genuine passion for what you're doing. Um, I mean, I think that's a hard conversation to communicate as well to some people, because some people, when they don't see immediate results or don't see immediate value, I mean, I think that can be very discouraging as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you talk people through, you know, the long-term aspects, especially when maybe there's short-term deadlines and short-term necessities that people have, like either to, to pay certain teams or pay certain, you know, things that kind of come up in, in life. Uh, Cause those two things are definitely not at odds with one another, but can seem hard when putting out fires is just so urgent. Yeah, that's, that's what's so difficult. And I'll be honest, I do have nonprofits that come to me and they say, you know, we lost a big funder. Uh, we need to bring in 30% of our revenue in the next six months. And it's really hard because there is no quick fix. There is no magic to this. And I, I think it's, it's hard to acknowledge that's kind of how fundraising works for the most part, every once in a while you will get lucky, um, you know, or go out to your supporters and, and really build those relationships and, and get those, you know, life changing organization changing gifts. But for the most part, it is doing work today that you might not see a return on for a little while. Um, and that's why I think like kind of going back to consistency and the day to day stuff is that, you know, we're recording this the third week of September year end fundraising is coming. We know, uh, especially I know, again, with the poll results, the majority of people on this call um, are receiving donations from individuals and individuals given the last 30 to 90 days of the year. Um, research actually shows that the last three calendar days of the year, so the 29th, the 30th and the 31st, some organizations see up to 25 percent of all their revenue in those three days. And so we're coming up to a really, really busy time. And the mistake I see a lot of organizations making is they think, okay, we'll do a Giving Tuesday campaign. And I love Giving Tuesday, nothing against them, but Giving Tuesday this year is December 3rd. That means that if your donors and your supporters only hear about, only hear from you starting December 3rd, that gives them 28 days to the end of the year to make their donation. And so, that um so i'm glad that we're recording this now because it also means that people can sort of get started 
in um, contacting their donors and, and, you know, kind of getting in front of them before that busy year end season. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that's, that's interesting, you know, talking about that as well, it's like, and we're talking about the consistency of communication and so forth, whether or not you see donations come directly from either an email or a, you know, social media post or anything like that, all of that seems to be you know, leading up to maybe if your giving is going to be focused in the last few days of the year, if you're just starting to have those communications at this point, then you have to catch people all, up all the way into that point. Whereas if you're having that consistent communication, it's going to feed into that. And these things are tough to measure overall. And I mean, before we move along, I mean, I did say we're going to save questions to the end, but there was one that was particularly relevant to this topic that Tanya yeah. just asked. Um, that was just asking for recommendations. If there's a program you use for these email communications, uh, whether it's MailChimp, Constant Contact, but just any recommendations of what anything works best in your experience or how you would sort of um, frame a recommendation around using a tool or using a specific solution to make these, mm -hmm. make these things happen. Yeah, Constant Contact and MailChimp, both of those I love, both of those are great systems. Um, I would say, you know, kind of play around and, and see which ones are best for you, but both of those are excellent. Um, I think any sort of email system where you are able to um, specifically personalize. Um, so that's, you know, when you're getting an email that says, Sebastian, will you, you know, support our organization, whatever it happens to be, but the, you know, you can customize the, um, the subject line to add somebody's first name. Um, as well as tracking both your um, open rates and your click-through rates. So how many people are opening um, and how many people, more importantly, are clicking on things within the email. So of course, that's not something you can do, um, I don't think anyways, if you're just using like Gmail or Outlook. So mm. it's good to invest in a MailChimp, in a constant contact. Um, both of those I like, but again, there's, there's plenty of different ones out there um, that all kind of have the same basic features um, so that you're able to um, to really kind of keep an eye on that. There are, um, depending on the system that you're using for processing your donations, there are some that integrate better with others. So if you are using a, uh, a CRM for tracking your donors, it might be worthwhile going to the CRM company and saying which you know mail service providers inter um, interface well. Um, with yours and there might even be a discount as well sometimes if you go through your um your crm so worth exploring for sure mm -hmm. and i do know some of these tools also have specific rates for nonprofits or free licenses yeah. for nonprofits. so always good to look um if that's something that people offer definitely super helpful no need to i i mean um and uh if you're kind of interested in sort of system selection and these sorts of things we did a conversation it's on our youtube on the iats youtube channel a few weeks ago about technology strategy and measuring impact so if you're really interested in finding out, you know, how to set that strategy ahead of time, definitely recommend that conversation. Um, had a lot of fun on that one as well. Uh, we've gotten a lot more professional since then, but uh, <laughs> um, but definitely, um, I think that's another good resource. If you if you're interested, would recommend checking that one out because that one's very focused on making sure that you set the strategy in place so that you know um, you're choosing a solution based on a direction or a certain metric that you want to obtain from that. So. Um, I think always important to, to choose it intentionally based on that. And yeah, that definitely helps. And I don't want to get too into that in this conversation today um, because at this point I want to focus and sort of pivot a little bit into some mm -hmm. solutions. Um, I think, I mean, important to, to note, and I'm sure everyone on this call is, is aware, but I want to, you know, reiterate, not every solution is going to work for everybody. Everybody needs to discover these things as, um, them, themselves through process and because everybody's context is a little bit different. Yeah. That said, I would love to hear some of the, the best practices or some of the things that you most commonly see uh, have the biggest impact with fundraising organizations so that we can start kind of giving some of those ideas or those, those things that people can start incorporating in their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think the first thing, and this usually surprises people, is um, to really limit. So if you're creating a fundraising plan, and, and this is what I do with my clients, I, I give them, um, we work on a 12-month customized fundraising plan together. And the most goals we ever have is three, maybe four goals. And usually people are quite shocked when I say that, because typically fundraising plans have I don't know, 20 goals of, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do all these different things. And again, going back to kind of what we talked about at the beginning of our conversation, you really get spread thin, right? Especially as a small team, you're doing 
10 different things and it feels like you're always fundraising and your donors kind of get tired of hearing from you because you're always asking for money in different ways. And so when we talk about limiting the number of goals in your fundraising plan, it really is about what are, um, and as we're building the plan together, we also do a really deep dive to not only see where is the revenue coming from and where is the effort um, being applied, but also what are the, our best um, methods and, and areas to tap into going forward. So for example, um, usually one of those goals is to increase unrestricted revenue. Um, as we know with, with grants, uh, with more, you know, campaign and, and program specific um, fundraising, it is really tied to that particular outcome, especially grants. Um, as we know, a lot of grant funders, they don't want to fund overhead, which is people, which is, you know, your rent, you're keeping the lights on, you're all of the things that are super important to actually delivering your work. Um, a lot of grant funders just want to fund the actual um, expenses. And so that unrestricted funding gives the flexibility to say, you know, we need to give so-and-so a raise or our rent is going up or, you know, these, these um, expenses that, you know, a funder might consider overhead. When you have unrestricted revenue coming in from, from various sources, it means that you can spend it in the best way um, for your organization. So always having that unrestricted um, is super important as a goal. And then for example, you know, I've seen organizations where they've tried and tried and tried and tried to bring on corporate partners and they spend a lot of effort and it doesn't result in much. And so I go in and I take a look and say, well, maybe your organization isn't right for a corporate partnership, but what if instead it's right for, I don't know, a fee for service, for example, or tapping into, um, alumni so people who accessed your services five or ten years ago let's let's see if they want so it's kind of taking a look at what are the places that we can invest uh time and, and resources and and money to have the best impact um as opposed to kind of like spreading ourselves too thin and, and really being um having our attention pulled in a lot of different areas mm -hmm. Focus is is absolutely key, and uh, mm -hmm. just making sure. And I think that um, really helps a lot with accountability and just making sure everybody understands what the goals and and what the um, what the organization is kind of working towards together. And you know, you can really bring different areas within your within your organization and and support one another, knowing that you have a very concrete goal that you're going after. And I mean, I think it is very tempting to be like, oh, but we also want to do this and we also want to do that yeah. because, you know, we've all we've all done that. And we've all found ourselves in that situation. Um, but I think based on some of these these best practices that you've mentioned and some of these ideas, I think one of the things that could be interesting to do while we're uh, here, if anybody's feeling brave and wants to share a link to their uh, online giving page, we did see in the poll that the number one majority of revenue is coming from donations from individuals. So if anybody feels brave and wants to share uh, a link to their uh, donation page, maybe Sarah, you could do a, a bit of an audit and show what, what works, yeah, what, what are some of the suggestions. So if anybody feels up to it, if not, no pressure. Uh, but if anybody's curious, we can do that. If not, I've got an example up and ready to go that we can, we can take a look at. But we'll uh, maybe wait a minute to see if anybody wants to have that overview. We'll promise to be it won't be it won't be too it won't be harsh i can't see the chat so i don't know if people yeah. are, are asking questions but i will <laughs> say for the donation page um usually it's a few it's not like a oh we need a whole website redesign it's usually just a few things that you can probably easily change to really optimize um, how donors are encountering your donation page. Um, and I should note that there's, you know, varying statistics, but a large majority of people who go to your website and go to your donation page are likely not completing their donation. A um, lot of research going into um, tracking those analytics. And, and so a lot of experts, definitely not myself, but people that, you know, do that, do that research and work have kind of come up with best practices of what makes a good fundraising donation page. Um, 
and they they kind of you know break it out into into different themes so that's what we're going to take a look at today so if somebody does want us to do that for their page feel free to uh put that in the chat if not i think sebastian we've got one um, from one of our volunteers who's offered to uh to share theirs so this is a donation page from uh someone on our team this is an organization called my artist corner great small nonprofit based uh, here in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I'm located. So um, just taking a look at their page right now, um, I know we've, we've chatted with them and they've said, oh, but it looks like it's really old. It looks like it was designed in, in a while. Sorry, Kate. I, sorry, Kate. That's your words, not mine. Um, so Sarah, I'd love if you could go through it and tell us a little bit about what your initial thoughts are and what are some of the things that people can look at and take from this and some of the things that people can just learn from overall. Sure. And I did want to note, we, we, um, uh, we're going to mention at the end, but I'll mention it now is that I will, if you are interested in having an audit of your donation page, I will be offering just free 15 minute, um, donation page audits if, if that's of interest. So Sebastian will share that link, um, at the end, because I do feel like it's one of those things that can be a bit of a quick win. Um, so uh, let me go through this page and, and you might even hear me say things that you can apply to yours right away. So number one, I would say I look across the top and I see all of the different um, categories. So home, art for sale. Yeah, thanks for highlighting there. What doesn't jump out to me is, is donate. And so mm -hmm. although it is best practice to have donate in the upper right corner, well, we notice that if you're if, whenever you do online shopping, and you'll probably see this now that I mention it, the cart function and the purchase function is almost always in the upper right corner. And psychologically, that's where we're looking for information. So it's perfect that they have donate and also contact us in the upper right. The, um, the one thing I would suggest for that is that donate, if it was in a different color, if it was its own button, something that really helps it stand out um, so that again, when somebody goes there and they're ready to donate, they know exactly where to click. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say, so let's go down the page a little bit, um, where it says the tax receipts and all that information on the left, very important. Um, but because we read from left to right, that is not the most important thing for people to know in that moment. Um, so I would actually put that at the bottom. Um, it does kind of let people know this is legitimate. You get a tax receipt, all those good things that signal to a person, this is a place I should trust. Um, but having it at the at the very bottom is ideal. There's also, you know, some older content in there, uh, you know, referencing 2022. So obviously just kind of keeping it up to date. Um, I like that they, um, you know, have also mentioned that you can do e-transfer, so different ways to do things. I would say, so where it says my art, my artist corner is always looking for sponsors. I might put that in a different place. I think when we, think about somebody taking action. If somebody has decided I want to donate, we want to get them to this page and we want to make it as simple and as clear as it can possibly be. So let's scroll up to the top again. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so where it says your donation, um, the, the part that says free forms by Zephy, I know that's a, a company that uh, obviously does those free donation forms. I don't know if you can remove that, but if you can, that would be ideal. The average person doesn't know what Zephy is. They don't know what that means. And it's just a bit confusing for the average donor. Um, as well, uh, just a little bit down where it has the light bulb and then the did you know. If that can re be removed, that would be ideal. It is important to let people know um, that they have the option to uh, give an administrative fee. So in this case, 10% um, of the donation is going to go to this company, Zephy, to actually process the donation. So they're trying to encourage people to increase their donation by 10% to cover that cost. In my opinion, I don't think it's worded as well as it could be. And I don't think that's the right place to put it. Again, the average person doesn't know all of this like insider language. We know why that is that way, but the average donor doesn't. And so I do think it, it, it could be in a, in a better place. Um, the donation amount, so where it says your donation and then it has dollar amounts. Um, I'd be curious to know, okay, oh, that's perfect. So it actually shows what the donations help achieve. That's really, that's really, really good. I really um, like that too. Yeah, it's yeah. really nice. I think that's excellent. Yeah, I was, my question was going to be, I wonder how they landed on 
those amounts, but now we know it's because it's yeah. an actual specific um, thing that they need. Is there, so I, what I'm not seeing is, so if I wanted to give $75, how would I do that? Is there a spot? I think here you can, can just type it in. Yeah, you okay. can type it in. Perfect. Okay. And see, and it's not necessarily clear either that that is a thing. So I might come to this page and have already decided in my mind, I want to give $75. And I look here and I go, oh, I can't give 75. And so it's just that bit of a mismatch of not necessarily being clear. Um, and then, yeah, the, the donation percentage, again, that's a, a function of that particular form. But I think it is a little bit confusing for the average donor. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like a tip function, like when you yeah. go and get yeah. a coffee, <laughs> that you're not exactly <laughs> sure what the tip is for. Um, and then uh, this is a corporate or organization donation. Make the donation in honor or in memory. That's all good. Um, the payment method. So this is a really interesting psychological thing that happens. And it's been tested and proven that... Um, and you'll notice this when you are doing online shopping as well, is that a lot of times beside payment method or just directly below, you'll often see an image of a lock, of a padlock. Mm, right. And it doesn't actually, and if you click on it, it usually doesn't even do anything. It's just this thing that happens in brains that says, oh, this means that this is locked and secure and trusted. Um, and again, there's been a lot of research that's shown when that's there, people, generally feel a little bit more confident that it is a legitimate site and a safe place to give their their credit card and their personal information. So I would just add that in um, mm -hmm. around where it says says payment method. Um, can you click on credit card for a second? I just yeah. want to see what opens up there. Yeah, that all looks perfect. That's really great. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it shows location and then donate. I might even below the donate button is I might even include a sentence that reminds people that this is a tax receivable donation and that the donation is going to a registered charity. Um, that can be really important for people as well, just to again, reconfirm for them that the donation choice that they've decided to make um, is legitimate and they should feel really good about it. Um, so yeah, those are just kind of some quick things that hopefully people are hearing and, and maybe those are things that you could even implement um, with your own donation page. Um, and, and again, sometimes the way that your website is set up, sometimes the way that a form might be set up, you don't have a lot of flexibility um, to change things, which I totally understand. Um, but if you do have capability to kind of move things around or adjust things, those are definitely some of the things that um, that'll make a difference. Wow, that was really helpful. Thanks so much, Sarah. I mean, really, really great that you just spot all these things. And it, it sounds like overall, um, it's all just making the experience as easy as possible and as, as clear for the donor, like really just trying to make it as, as straightforward as possible. And I do want to remind everybody, as Sarah mentioned, that she will be offering 15 minutes to do those audits as well for your donation pages. So if you're interested in having something just like that and get that uh, feedback that was just incredible and just very, very, you know, clearly lots of experience in, in donation pages. So thank you so much for sharing that. That, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. That was very, I, I had a couple things that I thought about beforehand, but you just pointed out like 10 more than I'd even okay, thought about. So <laughs> very, very, very cool to see that. Um, awesome. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to top that. That was great. Um, <laughs> um, what would you say for somebody else who's who's maybe here um, listening to this conversation and still thinking, you know what, but my fundraising is a little different. I don't know if this is going to work for me, because I think that's one thing that we we typically fall in that trap of being like, mm -hmm. but our situation is different. And in a lot of cases, everybody's situation is yeah. different. But how do you normally approach people who in sort of your your professional situations where it's just it's just tough to have certain conversations like that? Yeah. You know what? I think it's a really good point. And I think this especially comes up when we have organizations that are serving people who likely will not be our major donors, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're serving kind of more marginalized communities, um, sometimes get that pushback from clients of like, but we can't ask people for money. They don't have any money. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a, a reality, right? And something definitely to acknowledge. Um, but I will say that an interesting thing happens when we do 
become more inclusive in our fundraising asks. And I'll give an example. Um, I was working with an organization um, that was really trying to change around their board of directors and they really wanted to make it more diverse, more inclusive, really um, have a, a wide variety of people and different lived experiences on their board. Um, but they had this idea that, well, if you're on a board, you have to donate. And so I came in and I said, well, and, and, you know, they, they had that idea that board members should donate, but then they also had this idea that we want to include people who probably can't donate the, you know, four and five figure gifts that they were expecting. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what if instead of it, telling people how much they have to give, what if we just ask them to become donors? And I think that approach can work really well because if we take a step back from it for a second of like philosophically it's like who are we to say what someone can or can't do right and so if somebody is able to give five dollars a month and that is really really a stretch and really really meaningful for them it's like who are we to not even give them that opportunity to give back to maybe um a cause that's really important to them or maybe something that they're really passionate about or some you know, possibly an organization that helped them when they needed it. And so I do think that sometimes when we say, oh, we can't do this, or we can't ask these people, or, you know, our organization doesn't work that way, that is often the reality. But sometimes it is just kind of looking at things a little bit differently um, to see, like, is that actually true? Is that the way that we've always done things? We've always, you know, had people on our board who have a lot of money, who have these big networks. Okay, so that's how you have done it, but mm -hmm. do you have to do it that way going forward? Um, so yeah, just kind of, you know, taking a step back to see are there things, are there blind spots and things that we're not necessarily um, looking at yet? I love that. I mean, always questioning assumptions. I mean, it's it's funny how we always find ourselves in in a certain way of thinking and all of a sudden somebody tells you a different way. You're like, oh yeah, I can't do it that way. I mm -hmm. think those are always great moments overall. And I think one thing that's also really great about what you're talking about and what it's brushing up on, and uh, maybe one of the last questions I wanna ask with the time that we have, um, that gets really into the idea of stewarding your donors as well and maintaining those for the long term as well. Because you know, when somebody does a one-time donation or even sets up a, a monthly donation, that's not, where the relationship ends. It's not where you finish. You're like, okay, good job. We're done. So mm -hmm. what's sort of the next step? How do you, what, are, I mean, I think everybody's read the best, can find best practices, can Google that online and see lists of, of certain things, but I'd love to hear from you and in your experience, what are some of those things that people maybe overlook or some of those things that are, that are particularly helpful when chatting with people who've already donated and how do you maintain mm -hmm. those in, to, to contribute towards your fundraising goals? I'd say one of the um, easiest things to do, and I was going to mention this earlier when we were talking about email, but is when you have a thank you message that's going out to your donor, so somebody makes a donation and you're sending them a thank you, include in there something that encourages them to follow up with you. Mm -hmm. So one of the clients that I work with in the thank you email, it's, you know, thank you so much for donating to this organization. Your donation is helping blah, blah, blah. And then it, and then it says in like bold letters in its own separate line, we'd love to know what inspired your gift. Why does this matter to you? And so what instantly happens is instead of people just like being given information, all of a sudden a conversation is opening up and most people don't reply, which is fine. But the people that do reply, like you get these amazing stories um, that you can potentially use for content with, with their permission, if it's appropriate. Um, but you, it also starts allowing you to see your own work differently. Um, and I've had that happen where we do that. And then somebody says, well, I give because you help this particular, you know, group of people. And then you look at it and you say, oh, that's like 5% of our work. I can't yeah. believe that's what actually resonated with that person. But if it resonated with that person, should we be talking about it more? And it really gives you this like instant feedback of what people really enjoy about what you're doing. Um, so yeah, it kind of starts that conversation. And the other thing that we do, um, little touch points. So if you're doing an annual report um, that you're sending by email, if you can print off, I don't know, 10% of your donor list 
and select it at random. Don't just keep going back to, you know, people that are giving the most, but um, maybe it's your monthly donors. Maybe it's the donors that have been around the longest. Um, send it to them in the mail and maybe include like a little handwritten letter that goes along with it. Like those little touch points really, really make a difference. Um, and then finally, I would say also, again, a couple times a year um, is to reach out to a small number of people on your list and ask them if they'd be willing to have a 15 minute phone or Zoom call um, with you and let them know you're not going to be asking for a donation. It's really just to hear from them about their experience with your organization and also why they've chosen to be a donor. Um, and again, those conversations can lead to so many interesting um, directions, but it, at the end of the day, it, it makes donors feel um, appreciated and kind of continues building that relationship. Totally. And I mean, what I love about all that as well is, you know, tying that into the point that we just were chatting about as well, about questioning your own assumptions. Like a lot of times you mm -hmm. think your donors are giving for a particular reason, but unless you're having the conversations with that base as well, like you'll get so much more insight into why people give, what are the things that really inspire people and motivate people to do that. And I mean, we can have our hypotheses of what we think that is, but hearing it directly from them is really the best way to get that information. Mm -hmm. I mean, there really is no no other way to, to understand that better. So thank you, Sarah, that was a really great answer. Um, to close off, one of the questions that we asked on the registration for the webinar was for people to share their favorite fundraising tip. Wow. So I wanna pick a couple of these and share them with you. And I'd love to just get your reaction on some of them to see uh, you know, how you, you know, what your take is on it. So. One of the ones that I, I saw that I really liked was, and I mean, it makes perfect sense, but the worst anyone can say is no. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Yes. yes, actually, I was gonna say this earlier. I'm so glad that somebody brought this up. Is that the thing with fundraising is that it's a numbers game. And mm. I think when you approach it with that mentality, so if you have, if you ask a hundred people to donate, the default answer is no, right? You're gonna have probably, anywhere from 70 to 80 to 90% of people are gonna say no or say nothing. And so keeping that positive mindset and understanding that no is the default, I think it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of negative feelings away. If you're expecting people to say no, the yes is the surprise and the yes is something to be celebrated as opposed to always feeling like, oh, everybody is, you know, not giving to us. Well, that's kind of the default answer. And the yes is the success. And those are the things that you really need to focus on and just kind of keep pushing through. And I think too, when we're talking about, especially email, even the best open rates, even if 60% of your emails get opened 40%, it's like it didn't even exist. So keep mm -hmm. on like working through those numbers and, you know, resending to people that didn't open. Um, Cause it is, yeah, it's kind of a numbers game. Totally. Yeah. Great, great insight. Um, another one, I mean, we, we chatted about this. I think there's a couple that are on this uh, similar theme, a couple of the different tips, but always come back to building the relationship. There's yes. that one. There's uh, give a personal touch to your current donors. Yeah. There's deepen relationships and be authentic. Um, so to all these, all these sort of relationship oriented, um, yeah, pieces of, of advice or tips, what, what would your sort of thoughts be there? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a key piece of, of fundraising in general. And I do want to mention, um, cause I know a few people said that grants are where the majority of their revenue comes from. And I think people forget that grants are also decided on by people. And so when you can build a relationship with a funder, um, that's always, you know, gonna, gonna put you ahead, potentially save you time. So if you see a grant that looks like a good fit for your organization, I always advise organizations to try very, very hard. It's not always easy, but try very hard to find a contact at the funder and ask if you could have a quick 10 minute conversation to ask some clarifying questions or, you know, here's the program that we're running. Here's one paragraph, uh, description of the, the program that we're running. Could I talk to you for 10 minutes and, and ask if this is a fit with your funding priorities? Anytime you can start to build a relationship with those funders um, is going to put you that much further ahead. And you also might find out that it is not the grant for you at all. And so you move on to the next rather than wasting your time on something that was never going to be a fit. 
That's, I mean, that's a great point. And there was just another one. The next one I wanted to bring up was be strategic and look for the right fit. But I think what you just said also is that's, that's such a good one. I mean, and it goes back to your um, picking three or four goals tops, Mm -hmm. really just focusing and being very strategic and intentional with what you're, uh, with what you're looking to do. So, I mean, all the, all the, thanks you everybody who shared a, a favorite fundraising tip. They're all really, yeah. really great and uh, oh, appreciate yeah. it. Also, so a couple people were having some issues with the audio. So apologies for that. Oh, okay. um, and yeah, if, if, if you did, if it did break up or anything, we'll be sharing the recording as well. Yeah. Um, it, it'll be on YouTube. So if there's anything that you missed there that you want to go back on, we'll have that in the recording as well. Um, last thing. Sarah, where can people learn more? What do you have to share to the audience? What, what can people kind of get and learn from you? And what is it that you want to share kind of to close off? Yeah, sure. So uh, my website is charityshift.ca. So definitely take a look if you are um, looking for a fundraising plan uh, sometime in the next couple months. Definitely happy to um, to chat with people. I do have free um, two free things that I'm offering. No strings attached. I'm just Kind of giving them. Um, one is a list of si- 16 tasks that your board members can do to help support your fundraising. Um, and those are just tasks that over the years have come up um, so that board members can, can do things that are meaningful, that are really going to help push your fundraising forward, that might be things that are a little bit outside of the box of what they might have done in the past. Um, and then the other thing, because we are third week of September, we're ramping up to um, holiday and year end giving season, um, is I do have a free planning guide as well uh, that literally starts in September. So timing is perfect um, and kind of goes through week by week of the different tasks that uh, you could be and should be doing um, in order to have a really good uh, year end fundraising campaign. So both of those are available. I think, Sebastian, I think you're probably going to send the links in the follow up. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. But- yeah, great. And I'm always happy to chat with people um, on LinkedIn or um, if you want to book a meeting um, through my website, you can do that as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we'll make sure we'll send a follow up email. We'll get the recording kind of uh, edited up and on YouTube as soon as we can and send a follow up email with the recording as well as all the resources that Sarah just mentioned. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And thank you, Sarah, so much thank for your you. time and sharing uh, your insights with us. This was this was so great. And um, yeah really appreciate everything. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's always, always fun to chat about fundraising. I'm a little bit obsessed with it, as you can tell. So (laughs) I love talking to people about fundraising. Yeah. Well, I hope it's been helpful for the audience. Uh, One last thing again, we will be sending out that very, very brief survey. It's 30 seconds of your time and it's really helpful for us as well. We want to make sure that we're creating uh, conversations and content that's going to really help you out overall in, in everything that you're doing. So if you have any suggestions, tips, ideas, anything, it's always really well received and really valuable. So I appreciate everybody who participated, answered the polls, answered all the questions. Thank you so much. You really made this uh, a success for us. And we had a lot of fun, I think, having this conversation for you. So thank you so much.